My name is Rich Pearlstein, and I'm from Falls Church, Virginia, which is a historic little Virginia town, but now a bustling suburb of Washington, D.C. Uh, my first exposure to HPT was when I had a team of five abstractors who were looking through all the research articles that they could find on the behavioral analysis of programmed instruction. This was called the BAPI Project, and it was run by Dr. Israel Goldiamond, who was head of the Institute for Behavioral Research. I was a graduate student, and the abstractors who worked for me were either younger graduate students or undergraduates. And pretty soon we discovered that a lot of literature we find on the behavioral analysis of programmed instruction was in uh, performance and instruction, or whatever it was called. It was the NSPI Journal, back in the days when NSPI was the National Society for Programmed Instruction. So that was my first introduction to it. Um, so <clears throat> my biggest influences started out in verbal learning, of all things. A lot of people don't know what verbal learning is now. But back when I was uh, an undergraduate in 1961, uh, verbal learning was considered to be the pure way to learn about how people learn. What you would do would be to study paired associates of nonsense syllables. The concept being that if they were nonsense syllables, you did not have associations to them. Um, and so you could see how learning worked in a vacuum. Well, that didn't actually work out, and the days of verbal learning petered out somewhere in the 1970s. But uh, I was there early, and uh, William F. Battig, who, was, who did these huge experiments, one of which was called Experiment Giant, which had, which had 1,024 experimental cells, and probably like a six-level analysis of variance. <laughs> uh, and I got to run subjects through that and uh, set up the... Uh, schedule for doing it. That was fun. And also Donald Thompson, who was uh, uh, at that point into verbal learning and then went on to behavioral psychology. And Russell B. Johnson, who uh, was a dear friend and uh, a big early influence. Um, one other person that influenced me early on in my career was Og Lindsley, Ogden Lindsley, although I didn't know him at the time, but I read about his articles. He was doing uh, behavioral uh, research with actual humans rather than actual rats or pigeons uh, up in Waltham, uh, Massachusetts at the uh, behavioral research labs that uh, Skinner had gotten funding for him to do. But uh, I had other uh, clinicians uh, early on in my career, too, such as Carl Rogers and Fritz Perls. Uh, Fritz Perls uh, was the founder of Gestalt Psychology, and he, he was quite the character. Carl Rogers, I remember walking across campus with him once, and I thought, oh, I'm with the Carl Rogers. I'm walking with him across campus. Uh, this was at U.S. International University, where Roger Kaufman was a professor at the time in the uh, late 60s. So I'm there with Carl Rogers, and I'm thinking, ah, now is my chance. I'm kind of a long-haired undergrad, I mean, graduate student. And I say, so Carl, what you been into recently? And Carl looked very thoughtful and looked at me and said, begonias mostly. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's when I learned that sometimes my, ha my heroes might have feet of clay. Um, other early books that influenced me were Holland and Skinner's The Analysis of Behavior. It was written as programmed instruction, and it was a wonderful introduction to the many levels of operant conditioning. So uh, I really found that influenced me early on. And odd, bed, uh, odd uh, bedfellows for uh, Holland and Skinner were Carl Jung. Uh, during my graduate years, I read a lot about Carl Jung in the Bollingen uh, Foundation series, very scholarly, deep books. Uh, and I discovered later that uh, Jung was quite the phenomenologist. He really was into uh, detailed descriptions of the experience of human behavior from the inside out. 
and he convinced me that there are far more factors influencing our behavior than those that we're aware of. So that was a good early influence. So then uh, what happened to me was that uh, I found myself married and I found my uh, wife with a child on the way. Uh, pretty much, well we won't talk about the order, but I decided I'd better study the psychology of uh, the, uh, the rich, or at least people who are able to earn a living. And so um, I uh, hooked up, while well, still a graduate student, with people like uh, John Folley, who is the head of Applied Science Associates, my first consulting firm, and Bob Sweezy, with whom I partnered on a lot of work uh, in early uh, approaches to uh, instructional systems development and to criterion referenced training. Um, at the same time, the influences of early HPT authors began to in influence me. Um, we don't mention Bob Mager a whole lot these days. I don't know why that is, uh, but his early books were just wonderful. Um, the uh, preparing instructional objectives was seminal. It was such a clear description of how to do measurable instructional uh, objectives that uh, I cribbed very liberally from him in inventing the Army's Criterion and Reference Test Construction uh, process. And uh, once when I attended an early NSBI uh, conference, there was uh, uh, Bob with a big pin he had made which said plagiary on it, and so I made myself one that said plagiarizer. Uh, although I actually hadn't plagiarized him, I uh, really did tell him how much I honored his uh, work, and it was very good. And also with Peter Pipe, who used to contribute to uh, NSPI back in the day, uh, there was uh, analyzing performance problems, which was probably the first popular treatise on, hey, there's a lot more than skills and knowledge influencing what happens in organizations. And uh, during the 70s, other people began to influence me. And uh, really, they were, I thought, geniuses. They included people like uh, Butch Lineberry, Claude Lineberry. I, I can't claim to have ever been close enough with them that I deserve to call him Butch. but. Uh, I did once or twice, and uh, Bill Datterlein, who uh, was also great fun, and uh, Don Toasty and Gary Rummler, um, which I, I loved about Gary is any time I'd see one of his wonderful charts uh, showing the secret meaning of things and how they really work, they change. So he was always perfecting, moving on, and that was great fun. And I'll mention one other personal tutor, uh, Bud Branley who had been a Catholic priest, a Marino, uh, working on missions, largely in Japan. And he became an, uh, he, he left the church. He fell in love with a woman and uh, left the church and got married. And uh, uh, I met him at the U.S. Department of Labor, where he had a wonderful understanding of how you translate uh, behavioral principles into real life work with actual managers. Uh, who don't go by the book. So that was a very good experience. So now we move to my 30-second elevator speech on HPT. Usually when I'm on an elevator, of course, I have a little placard that I can look at that has my speech, but uh, it really comes down to what I do is I help organizations determine and achieve worthy outcomes that they care about. Now that's something I can say in about 10 seconds, um, which by the time I've said hello and smiled and so on, I'm pretty well into my 30 seconds. I used to say, uh, I help achieve desired outcomes. Uh, but then I began to realize that uh, often organizations weren't thinking so much about uh, what outcomes they desired, but more about what activities they desired. So I uh, added uh, determine outcomes. I help them determine outcomes to my speech. And I realized that sometimes organizations desired uh, outcomes uh, that 
violated my sense of values or what I thought was right. So I borrowed from Tom Gilbert and began to speak about worthy outcomes. And finally I realized that just because I thought the uh, outcomes were worthy didn't mean the organization uh, necessarily did. So uh, I added worthy outcomes that they actually care about, which leaves me with my 10 second speech, uh, which is I help organizations determine um, and achieve worthy outcomes that they care about. Uh, if the elevator door still hasn't opened and people want to say uh, more about it, I can tell them how I do that. But uh, if they haven't asked, I just leave it at that. Uh, my current focus for my own learning about other aspects of human performance technology is ways of dealing with the largely unseen and often irrational variables that affect uh, elements of organizational culture and individual behavior. Are there reliable ways of telling when irrational factors are in play? Uh, I don't know. What signals do I look for? How do I know if irrational factors might be outweighing the rational ones? We take a pretty rational approach, and that's a good thing. I'm not knocking it, but at the same time, there are these other factors, and I'd like to know when to delve into them. Uh, a, uh, a, I don't want to say past president, uh, but a, a very active ISPI member has talked about what I do is I really get into the organization and I find out who the uh, explicative deleted really are and I figure out how we can wall them off from influencing some of the other behavior. So how can our current storehouse of uh, interventions deal with uh, irrational factors and not just the rational ones like schedules of reinforcement and clear and timely feedback and uh, focusing on what people really need to be able to know and do to do their jobs? Okay, an HPT term that I'd like to uh, define is one of my own creation that I've been promoting a lot, which is evidentiary chain. Uh, this is a causal chain that links changes in organizational outcomes back to widespread practices of individual behaviors that uh, occur on the job. Uh, widespread individual behaviors that have been modified, that if I look backwards, I can see that the modification had something to do with the interventions we developed. And this establishes that the interventions led to the changes in performance, which themselves led to the changes in outcomes. So the, uh, I've, had, I've had people tell me that, well, gee, I would just focus on level four, uh, the organizational impact, and I think that's worthy but to actually show that what I did caused that, I have to be able to move backwards. And when I say I, I sort of grimace internally because I realize it's a whole team of people that does it. I might help engineer what happens, um, but it always is a team effort, a, an effort among collaborators. Okay, this brings me to a few stories uh, from uh, my past at NSPI and ISPI that I would like to share. Uh, well, back in the day, don't you like that expression, back in the day? We always used to say, back in the old days, uh, but now it's just back in the day. I don't know what happened to the old days, but I'm geezing on. And what was really so much fun about going to ISPI or then NSPI conferences was the amazing collection of uh, colorful, funny, very smart old guys. Uh, there were some very smart women also. Uh, they usually, because of societal pressures at the time, weren't quite as much at liberty to uh, be as flamboyant as some of the colorful and crazy old guys. Uh, or at least they were less likely to admit to uh, what they would do in private. 
Uh, the primary ones that uh, come to mind are uh, good old Claude or Butch Lineberry, Bill Betterline, Joe Harless, uh, Don T Toasty. They would tell tales of the good old days themselves that would just always uh, crack me up. They had a brilliant sense of irreverence. There'd usually be a moral to the story. Uh, it would apply to uh, behavior. It wasn't just that it was funny, but they were uh, really strange and irreverent. One of my favorites was at a uh, awards dinner. ISPI used to have awards dinners. They were long, drawn-out events. Uh, they usually had a colorful presenting speaker. You'd have dinner and then they'd have endless awards, which were only interesting if you were one uh, getting an award. And you'd have uh, us sitting around either in uh, suits or uh, gowns or, or even tuxedos and uh, fidgeting. But during one awards dinner, the invited speaker, who was one of the people in the above gang I mentioned, uh, talked about uh, a story on one of the others of that gang who was in the audience. And they were at uh, some kind of banquet. And under the table, one of the members had to, uh, let's say, uh, take down his fly to readjust matters. Okay, so he did that. When he zipped it back up, unfortunately, he caught the tablecloth in it. And then it was time where he had to go to the restroom. The only thing is, now the <laughs> tablecloth was jammed in the zipper. He couldn't bring it down. If he got up from the table, he'd pull the whole tablecloth up. He couldn't do that. He's trying a knife under the table, <laughs> just saw at, the, at it. And meanwhile, in this very formal awards banquet, we have this uh, description going on. And uh, not only was it hilarious, but the person in the audience about whom the tale was yelling out that, no, he had it wrong. It really happened to him, the speaker, and not to me, the, the uh, victim of it. So that was the kind of hijinks that went on. And uh, I just really uh, loved it. Uh, another memorable uh, banquet speech involved Butch reading one of his memorable le letters from Mama. He, he used to publish some of them, and he had a couple, uh, I think, at two different banquets, he read a letter from Mama. Uh, I can't quote from it directly, so I'll uh, look at my notes. Uh, this was one he gave in San Francisco at NSPI's 24th annual conference, uh, which was probably in 1996, because Wiley published it in P&I uh, in July 1998 in Performance Instruction, which is now the Performance Improvement Journal. The letter went on for pages, but I'll just quote a couple of paragraphs, because uh, I think I'm allowed to do that within copyright laws. Um, Joe would attribute statements that his lovable Southern mom, I said Joe, I meant Butch, uh, would attribute statements that his lovable Southern mama would send to him in letters. And uh, here's one I like. Is it just me, or are you folks getting so heads down on instructional technology issues that you fail to look for, perhaps fail to see, the far-reaching worldwide applications of a true technology of human performance? Why, I can remember a group of NSPI, I can imagine a group of NSPI members writing an SEX manual. What with needs assessment, front-end analysis, target population analysis, derivation of objectives and hierarchies of objectives, learning problem analysis and criterion test specifications, well, there would remain neither the time nor the want to floss. Uh, and then some fool would design a job aid for lighting a, po a post-coil cigarette. Uh, Oh, one other thing he said earlier in that same mama speech was, will you please write and tell us what it is that Roger Kaufman has been trying to explain all these years? Uh, be sure and send a copy to Roger, as I expect he may have forgotten what it was by now. Uh, now, the, the interesting thing there is that uh, Claude was really a, a good-spirited uh, fellow, 
And I'm sure he loved and respected Roger, which is why he took the liberty to tease him, but his irreverent sense of humor I just thought was uh, always great. And this is probably a good place to, for me to plug one of the uh, benefits of ISPI membership. Uh, I was able to find those quotes from uh, Butch because, uh, like all other ISPI members, I can use the online uh, library of Wiley to look up all the old uh, P&I articles in their entire uh, printed version. So that was good. Another story is about how kind the good old boys were. They were kind and accessible. Uh, sometimes you hear stories about uh, folks coming to ISBI conferences and saying, well, they were kind of cliquish. But uh, that's never been my experience. My experience was that if you went up and talked to people, uh, it's not like the rock and roll stars. Uh, the, the groupies are far and few between, even if you're a famous uh, human performance technologist. So, for example, I remember one night uh, with uh, Brother Joe or Bubba Joe, uh, Joe Harless, uh, I found myself sitting at the table right next to him, and we were adjacent. We were both facing the stage, so we were right next to each other. And uh, I'd met him several times in a couple of other conferences, but you know, you meet hundreds of people. Of course, I knew who he was, but I solemnly reached over and said, Hi, Joe, Rich Perlstein. He shook my hand. He said, Oh, come on, Rich, I know who you are. And that was just made me feel so accepted that uh, Joe would know who I was, even though I was young and early in the organization. Um, he did have a heck of a memory, too. Then it was fun. We just sat all dinner, uh, you know, fidgeting and kibitzing and tossing one-liners to try to crack the, each other up while we were sitting in our tux uh, watching the awards. Of course, Joe had to get up occasionally to accept an award, but that's how it went. Uh, I'd also like to mention another story that attending uh, ISPI conferences often had unexpected surprises in store for me. One was about 25 years ago. Uh, when I was in an elevator and I was expounding uh, at a conference hotel and I was expounding on an early experiment at the Behavior Re Research Laboratory at Metropolitan State Hospital outside of, uh, I think, Wallingham, Massachusetts. That was Skinner's lab. And I was telling the story of an unexpected outcome in work with a longtime patient diagnosed with catatonic schizophrenia. What had happened was that the researcher had noticed the researcher was working with another subject, but he noticed this catatonic who hadn't spoken in years, his eyes moved when he gave this other person a stick of chewing gum. So he started to reward that person uh, just for looking at him, just for his eyes shifting toward him by giving him a stick of gum. Then he began to shape behavior. He'd only give the stick of gum if the person turned his head and looked at him. Then the person had to, he was trying to shape the behavior. He, so he started to say, say gum, say gum. And finally the guy said, may I have some gum please? And that was the end of the catatonia for a while, uh, although sadly it came back. But anyway, I was telling this story and I attributed it to Og Lindsley. I was in the elevator and I said, yeah, that was work by Og Lindsley. And, uh, <clears throat> I heard a clearing throat, and there was a tall, thin gentleman with white hair next to me, and he said, no, that was Nate Azrin. He was a postdoctoral student who worked for me. I'm Og Lindsley. And that was when I first uh, met Og, and uh, we, we developed a friendship, and he taught me a lot. He was a terrific fellow. So I kind of feel like uh, I've gone on long enough. <laughs>